Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to um, be looking at uh, Bice Lazzari uh, in a moment. Um, but I thought it would be a good idea just to introduce, in case any of you don't know it, uh, the place where the exhibition of her work is taking place uh, in London at the moment, and that's the Esterick Collection. So you can see a photograph of it here. Um, and you can see it's a, it's a lovely sort of early 19th century uh, terrace house, or, or townhouse rather. Um, and in it, you'll find the collection of modern Italian art, which basically means anything of the 20th century and since, which was collected by Eric Esterick. Um, and uh, he discovered Italian, contemporary Italian art while visiting Italy. He befriended many of the artists, so he got the work directly from them. And by the time he, uh, he died in 1993, uh, he'd been collecting for about 50 years. He'd amassed this really quite remarkable collection of works that um, include some, some very famous pieces, particularly of the futurists and uh, some, some of the metaphysica paintings, uh, painters like uh, de Chirico. Um, so the futurists uh, are sort of what you, you expect from Italian art, and, and it's, it's worth just bearing them in mind as we, as we sort of look at Lazzari. So you've got the address up there. It's not far from uh, the Angel in Islington or from Highbury, also in Islington uh, for the tube stations. Um, and uh, as I said, it's a very nice day out to go and, uh, or morning out to go and see uh, the Esterick collection. Here's the website opening page for uh, the exhibition. As you can see, it says modernist pioneer. The, the brown or red thing uh, with black lines on it, you can see underneath that's a detail of one of, one of her, um, her paintings. So uh, you're getting a sense that we're going to be looking at uh, an abstract painter. And if I read out what it says on that website, um, we get perhaps a sense of what they're trying to do. They're trying to, uh, in a way, uh, rediscover this lost woman artist and present her as uh, an unacknowledged pioneer who we should know more about. And I don't really have a problem with that, but let me just read what it says. Uh, exploring the aesthetics of Art Informel, which is um, an art movement. Um, uh, well, I'll say more about that in a moment, actually. Art Informel, minimalism and hard edge abstraction. Um, her paintings made a significant contribution to 20th century Italian art, yet have remained largely unknown outside her native country. Organized in collaboration with the Archivio Bice Lazzari in Rome, this exhibition features some 40 works highlighting the artist's lyrical and highly original interpretation of it, it abstract art. Well, maybe we should take that apart a little bit. Let, let's deal with that word art informel. Um, art informel is, is um, it's not really a movement. Um, that's why I sort of hesitated to try and do a, a potted summary of it. Um, uh, art informel, uh, informal art really, it's, it's, it's a, a kind of collective name for a group of, of smaller movements that uh, in, mainly in Europe uh, and to some extent uh, in North and, and particularly South America, but mainly in Europe, um, artists who were abstract, um, who were working often in quite impoverished conditions, so they didn't have a lot of money to buy art materials, uh, and so quite often used um, found objects uh, and the detritus of, of um, you know, the, the post-war world industry and things like that to create their works. So they, they tend to be quite dour and done in colour, but um, uh, they, they are sort of quite interesting, I mean, quite, quite interesting if you're, if you're into that kind of art. And, and in a way, Lazzari fits into that to some extent. Well, Bice is a nickname. Um, her real name is Beatrice Lazzari. Uh, here we see her, um, born in Venice in 1900, um, and she initially was training to be a musician. Uh, she studied at the Benedetto Marcello Conservatory, um, but despite her family wanting her to continue as a musician, she decided she wanted to study fine art, visual art, and so she enrolls at the Venice Academia, the main art school in Venice. 
Now, her family background uh, was uh, really well off. Uh, they were traders and building contractors. Uh, so there was family money, but um, as she says later on, uh, it, it all disappeared around about 1928. So we'll, we'll, we'll follow that through. Um, let, let's just look at the time, kind of art that she was producing early on. So uh, if we go to uh, an early work, so here we are, 1929. Um, so she's, uh, she's a young woman, she's uh, 28, 29 years old. Here we can see uh, a self-portrait. And if you look at the self-portrait, um, in a way, it's, uh, I think it's not, not too cruel to describe it as really quite conservative. Uh, if you think about what's going on in 1929, elsewhere in Europe, you've got uh, surrealism is in full flow. You have um, uh, abstract um, uh, forms of expressionism. You also have abstract forms of geometric art. You have constructivism. Here we seem to have something that uh, I'd suggest is almost uh, a throwback. If, if, we, uh, if we are looking uh, for uh, antecedents for this, what are we thinking about? Well, we might think about even going back into it, Impressionism or kind of version of Impressionism. It's a kind of soft modernism, in other words, and it, it fitted in with what was going on in Venice. So, for example, it's not that dissimilar to her fellow Venetian painter, uh, uh, her fellow Venetian, the painter uh, Virgilio Guidi. Uh, here is a Guidi, uh, and you can see uh, it's, again, a kind of soft modernism. Perhaps post-impressionism is more accurate in a sense. The context in which uh, Lazzari was working um, in Venice was that she was uh, both an art student, but she was also mixing with a group of artists and other cultural figures who had formed a, a kind of informal club uh, called the Scuola di Burano. Uh, and, and this uh, was led uh, by uh, Pio uh, Semaghini. Um, this is Pio Semaghini. There we go. You see him there. So he's he's a, he's a watercolorist, really, or uh, he's an artist anyway. I suppose you know when we look at things like this, it, it's also worth just bringing in probably the most famous Italian artist who works in this manner, um, and that that's uh, Modigliani. Now, by this time, once you get to the nineteen twenties, uh, Modigliani, of course, is 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 very much within the French. Uh, art scene, the Paris art scene is part of the school uh, of Paris, but it, it's always uh, worth mentioning him as an Italian artist because uh, if you're an Italian artist living in Italy, even if Modigliani is, is in Paris and being called a French artist or French school artist or Paris school artist, um, you're going to look at him as a kind of uh, role model. But it's this kind of soft impressionism that uh, Semeghini that dominates. And, and, and here is a Semeghini. Here is the Gardens of Burano um, from four, 1942. And you can see it does look very much like a kind of uh, impressionist painting. Um, the Scuola di Burano uh, wasn't just um, painters, though. It did include uh, writers like uh, Aldo Camarino, um, but also modernist architects like Carlo Scarpa. And I, I think that's important because uh, 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 Lazzari uh, very much gravitated uh, towards architects. And um, during uh, crucial periods in the 1940s into the 1950s, um, she was working with uh, architects um, on interior design. So I think um, it's, it's quite important to make, uh, make that link here. And the thing is that um, the, although the Scuola di Burano uh, was a group of, of, of quite conservative painters in some respects, um, the architects uh, are really quite modernist in their, their outlook. They, they seem to be more progressive, and that may also explain why uh, Lazzari gravitated towards them. Nonetheless, she is producing these kind of Guidi, Semeghini paintings, this kind of impressionist inspired soft modernism. So here is a portrait uh, of uh, Scarpa or Gigi as he was uh, known. Uh, and here is uh, a girl with flowers from 1934. Now, before we move on from 1934, because in a way this is a, a sort of turning point, let's just bring in one other aspect of Lazzari that's very important, which I, I've, I've already hinted at really with uh, the idea that she is collaborating with architects on interior designs, because what happens 
in 1928, if we take um, it at face value what she says, um, the family lost money, she, she had to uh, find work to do. So what's the work she, that she does from 1928, 1929 onwards, where she decides that uh, rather than being a penniless artist, uh, with a, a canvas under her arm, as she describes it, peddling uh, her wares around galleries, uh, she's going to become a designer, or she's going to become a kind of artisan maker. So she starts making uh, textiles, textile art, we might think of it uh, as being, such as uh, bags and belts like this, um, also uh, cushions, hand-knotted rugs, um, tapestries, um, all sorts of things, anything you could really make out of textiles. She said, when my father died in 1928, I had to face life on a practical level. And so rather than walking around with a painting under my arm, I took a loom and started making applied art, fabric, scarves, bags, belts, carpets, in order to continue living in the climate I so ad adored, namely freedom. So we do have a kind of modernist uh, idea there of the artist being a, a kind of free agent uh, and so not uh, beholden to anybody. An artist artisan she kind of uh, sent, uh, we get a sense of. But what I want you to notice about these uh, very early uh, designs for fabrics, textiles and bags and things, is that it's the very first sign we have of her moving away from that slightly fey type of realism of her early painting into abstract pattern making essentially. So there you can see it with the, the banding and I think that banding is going to be quite important. It's kind of leet motif, it becomes something she repeats, these red bands. Um, but also notice the way that the bag is woven, this very heavy weave. Um, remember when you, when you do weaving, um, it, it's, it's a kind of repeated motif. You have what you could think of as each stitch, if I can call it that, I'm sure it has a more technical name, but each stitch of the weave uh, is a kind of, it's a kind of unit which is built up and you keep building it up again and again until you stop. But in theory, it could almost go on forever. I mean, you could, you could almost weave forever like uh, Penelope in the, uh, in the Odyssey. You could, you, could, you could keep making the same mark, the same unit keep repeating it um, and uh, it, it doesn't have a, an inevitable end point until you decide it has an end point. Now all of that might seem a little bit tied for loose and a little bit obtuse but I just want you to remember that idea within weaving because I think it's going to be very important for uh, Lazzari's painting later on. The, the unit that can go on forever uh, I think is, is significant but at this point notice the kind of abstract quality that we have. It's a very modern looking bag in that sense, even today. So this cushion that she designed, you can see, looks very like a modernist cushion. It looks like a very modernist piece of, of textile, but it also looks like a very modernist piece of um, art. It, it's almost like a, a Kandinsky of the same period in some respects. So are we looking at a foretaste of what's to come? Now, there are other pieces that uh, she makes that perhaps are a little bit uh, more figurative. So here we seem to be seeing in this tapestry, uh, so a wall hanging in this case, uh, we seem to be seeing um, uh, peacock feathers, uh, stylized peacock feathers. Um, so that fits in in 1928, that fits in with what we expect um, to have in the 1920s. It's kind of art deco piece in it, its look. So that fits in with the time. Um, but it's, it's probably more figurative than perhaps any of the other pieces that she produces. But what's interesting about this piece is what it's made from. It's, it's made from len lenchi cloth. Now, lenchi uh, was made in Turin. It, it is a natural material. It's, it's, uh, it's made of wool and it's a, kind of, it's a kind of felt, really, a felted wool. And it, it started to be produced in, uh, in Turin from around about 1918, 1919, just after the First World War. Um, so it's a modern material, even though it's a natural material, it's a modern material. And I think that idea of using modern materials is important to her. Uh, so we find her using this unusual material. But these things that she exhibits, so the, sorry, these things that she's making for sale, she also exhibited. So they are exhibited, for example, at the, the Monza International Exposition, which was a, a, a kind of decorative arts equivalent of the Venice Biennale uh, held in Monza. I think it may even still exist. We know she exhibited uh, textile pieces there in 1930, for example. So she is exhibiting them as if they are a kind of work of art, uh, not just 
um, functional decorative objects. And in all of that, I suppose we can make parallels with women in particular elsewhere. We could go to Germany, for example, at about the same time, and we can think of, for example, Anne Albers. And, and some of you may remember the big exhibition of Anne Albers at the Tate Modern a few years ago. Um, uh, Annie Elbers, uh, she studied at the Bauhaus, um, but while she was there, uh, she was she was effectively forced to go into the textile department, really due to an assumption by the head of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, um, that um, it, it, women should specialise in only in certain art and craft activities, um, like weaving. Albers herself, she wanted to be a painter, but, but this was considered uh, an uh, un unsuitable activity for a woman by, uh, by Gropius. As a consequence, in the weaving sheds, she turned weaving into a medium that allowed her to explore abstraction um, in, in exactly the way, same way that, that a painter might use paint to explore abstraction. So her, her textile pieces, her textile um, art pieces, um, are in many ways some of the most striking works of abstract art in the 20th century. Now, I don't think Lazzari could possibly have been, have been aware of what Al Albers is doing. She might have been, but it's possible that uh, at the 1930 uh, uh, Mondo uh, uh, exposition she saw things. Um, but uh, it's quite unlikely. I think in some ways she's, she's coming to this quite independently uh, through uh, a kind of translation of what's going on in the art world generally in painting into textile art. So we've got almost two Lazzaris producing two different types of work. Um, uh, Lazzari uh, was a painter, um, but she was a painter in Venice where the, the full thrust, thrust of, of modernist uh, painting hadn't really taken hold in the way it had in Milan or Turin uh, back in the 1910s uh, and early 1920s. The, the, there is no futurist movement, for example, in, in sleepy Venice. And in many ways, there shouldn't be because Venice kind of represented what the Italian futurists in places like Milan hated most about Italy, its inescapable sense of history. Uh, in fact, the futurists were explicit in their attacks on Venice uh, because of its inescapable history. So we have Lazzari, the painter, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, the soft modernist painter. And yet we also have Lazzari, the, the textile artist, the textile designer, who seems to be absolutely contemporary, absolutely at the forefront of things going on in Europe, except, uh, and this is possibly where I'm a, li a little bit pedantic, um, when somebody is a pioneer, for me, um, that suggests that people follow on from her. I'm not sure that's true with Lazzari. It's, it's kind of as if she's working in a, in a bit of a vacuum. She's doing the similar things to perhaps, say, Albers and perhaps even Kandinsky at the same time. But uh, in many ways, uh, nobody knows about her and we don't really get a sense of uh, much in the way of, 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 of later influence coming out of her. Well, in Sleepy Venice, then, we have a certain Lazzari, but perhaps that's indicative, perhaps all of those abstract pieces are indicative that Venice cannot hold her. Um, so when she finally escapes from Venice in 1935, um, she moves to Rome, the centre of the Italian art world. Uh, many of the futurists, in fact, were in Rome by now. Um, and it's there that she was able to take the ideas that she'd already been exploring in textile art uh, into her painting. And we, we see a notable change uh, in Lazzari. However, there's going to be a delay in all of this because in Rome, she really concentrates more on the textile art. So what we find is that she starts collaborating with um, architects and interior designers in Rome, in particular, Ernesto uh, uh, Lapadula. Here you can see him. Uh, Lapadula was uh, an advocate and a member of a movement known as Italian rationalism. And if you look at this design for a seaside villa uh, by Lapadula, uh, you can see it's well in uh, the, uh, the, the remit of 
what we would call international modernism. Uh, so things like the work of Walter Gropius or Mies van der Rohe at the Bauhaus, um, it's, it's very like Bauhaus design, it's very like constructivist design, it's very like de Stiel design and, and, and the work of, say, Mondrian. So we end up with um, a kind of uh, simplified, reduced down uh, form of uh, geometric modernist uh, construction. But Italian rationalism was, was in some respects, a, a slightly strange offshoot of international modernism, because whereas international modernism tended to, um, in many ways, emulate what we see with futurism, tended to um, uh, eschew uh, references to the past and, and, and only look forward, only look to the future. Um, when you look at Italian rationalism, um, it doesn't quite do that. Um, so here, for example, we have what, what is probably uh, Lapadula's um, uh, most famous work, the Palace of Italian Civilization in Rome. Uh, it's one of the most uh, famous surviving pieces, in fact, of Italian fascist architecture, although uh, Lapadula does not seem to have been a fascist. His family were very uh, left wing, but nonetheless, he's entering competitions and he's adopting the style that is approved of uh, by the fascist state under Mussolini. So what do we have here? Well, we have all the geometry that we might expect to find in international modernism. And we have uh, a very simplified, reduced structure. But at the same time, we have all of these arches, which seem to reference ancient classical Roman architecture, in particular the Colosseum, of course. And in fact, what we have here with these tiers of arches is a kind of unit again, which gets repeated. So if you look at uh, the Colosseum, one of these units, we would call that a motif. In fact, it's sometimes referred to as a Colosseum motif. So you have columns either side and you have an arch in the middle. So that's been reduced down here into uh, more or less just an arch. The columns are just a plain wall in a sense. Um, but that unit gets repeated again and again horizontally and then, of course, uh, um, uh, vertically as well. Remember that because I think that's going to be uh, very important with Lazzari. We've already had the idea of uh, the repeatable unit in weaving. Now we've got it in Italian rationalism and part of Italian rationalism, what makes it rational is that the unit is repeatable. It's a kind of uh, rational building system. Well, as I suggested, uh, Lazzari appears to have almost abandoned play, uh, painting in Rome, at least until 1950. Um, she'd concentrated until then on her interior design work, but very quickly after she returned to painting, she gained recognition. So in 1951, she finally has a first solo exhibition. Uh, that's at the uh, Casa Panca Gallery in Rome. But by then, her work had changed dramatically. Um, I think the influences coming from the abstract forms, if you like, the rational geometric forms of the Italian rationalists and wider European modernism are coming into her practice. But so is that influence from the abstract textile designs that she was already making. So when she emerges in the post-war period as a painter again, we start seeing her making abstract paintings, or as in this case, an abstract drawing. In fact, this is a drawing with Conti Crayon as well. Now, initially, as you can see in this composition from 1955, she seems to have gone for what I think is probably best described as a, a kind of organic free form or free hand form of abstraction. So using multiple media, so we've got pencil, ink, pastel, as well as paint, but these are creating uh, organic compositions. We don't have many hard edges in these uh, paintings. Now, I suppose you could look at this and we could think about what she actually acknowledges is an influence in her work, which is her first love of music. Remember, she was going to be trained as a musician. Um, it's not uncommon for abstract artists in this period to say that their paintings are like music and sometimes they are kind of inspired by music. So perhaps when we see, you know, these rhythmic lines, these flowing lines, maybe these are, are notes or something like that. And then this bright splash of red, perhaps that is also a kind of reference to some, some crescendo in the music. And we're, we're looking into the kind of uh, visual equivalent of music in that way. 
But I also think we should notice other things. The, the red seems to be a re recurring theme. If you remember, I asked you to remember the notice, the red in the bag. And I suppose we can see it there. It becomes a kind of leet motif in, in her work. Um, here it is again. We've got the lines of red and we've got the, the large red block in a way. So we perhaps have other ways of reading this. And if we look at uh, a painting of this period, Motif in Red, quite interesting title given how little red there is on it. But again, you get the same kind of things. We're getting a sense of uh, the red being a, a recurring theme, this block of red. But she almost can't escape from that interior design, that textile design background that she, she has been doing for so long. So she says even when she paints, she can't produce just a pure painting that stands on its own. When I do a painting, she says uh, in 1957, I always, always think secretly about the wall where I, could, where I could be painting at that moment, about the space and the architecture of which that painting should be intended, which means that maybe I don't believe in purist painting, in painting that lives on its own, autonomous in its abstract isolation. Well, what she's referencing there is a belief among some artists in the 1950s, that the painting is a, they would call it an autom autonomous art. In other words, the painting is a kind of reality in itself that, that doesn't relate to anything else around it. So you could put it anywhere. It's, 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 it's not made for a specific location. Uh, it's it's uh, autonomous and abstract, as she says, in its isolation. But what interests me about that statement is the relation, the, the statement about uh, space and architecture. Uh, if you want to give a fancy name to it, we would call that architectonic, so kind of architectural space. Um, she seems to be interested in space all the time. And I think that is something that, again, we're going to take forward. Here's another painting from around this period. So these are, if you like, uh, Lazzari re-emerging into the art scene in Italy, uh, very little outside of Italy, but very much in Italy um, as uh, a painter again, rather than a textile artist or interior designer. Uh, here's Moon Game. Um, and again, you've got lots of the very same type of uh, motifs, these sort of organic forms, uh, very little in the way of, of geometric straight lines, although there are some straight lines in there, but also notice this very textured surface, um, you know, it's almost encrusted, it's, 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 it's not just straightforward paint, there seems to be sand and grit and God knows what mixed in with the paint. And we're seeing in these works, as we move forward uh, towards the end of the 1950s, uh, an increasingly rough treatment of uh, the materials. Well, this rough treatment of the materials or use of rough materials like adding sand and grit and, and ground glass or semi-ground glass to the painting. Um, she's clearly moving in that direction anyway in the late 1950s, but towards the end of the 1950s, um, rather mysteriously, um, she, she, she gets oil paint poisoning. Um, quite how she does this, I, I'm not sure, but for some reason her body uh, reacts uh, as a kind of uh, very extreme form of uh, allergic reaction uh, to um, something in the oil paint, probably the linseed oil, which is, it can be quite an unpleasant thing. Um, and, and, and she can't use it anymore. And uh, the dates given for this are, are a little bit ambiguous. There are two dates for, given for this in, in various sources. Um, some say it's 1959, so it would fit in with this painting. Some put it as late as 1960 when this happens. But what it seems to lead to is her producing work that is uh, not using oil paint and she's, she's trying to find other materials. So she mixes mud and grit and sand and, and, and bits of glass and things like that with glue. She starts using uh, collage. She starts using, if she's going to use colour at all, she starts using uh, tempera, which is an egg-based paint rather than an oil-based paint. Um, and so when we look at uh, these, these images from the late 50s and uh, taking that as the date when this happens, um, it, um, it, it, it's partly out of necessity, but the point is that she's moving in that direction uh, anyway. This one, for example, uh, Experience One from 1959 is made of uh, egg tempera paint together with sand uh, and bits of string are glued onto it and there are other collaged bits on it. And Super, uh, uh, super Fiche uh, LSR4 
uh, you can see here almost looks like the surface of rock or concrete. Uh, so we get this very textured surface, which seems to have uh, sgraffito marks etched onto it. Well, okay. 1965 or uh, sorry 1959 or possibly 1964 she has to do this anyway um because of the uh, the problem with oil paint but as we've seen she's moving in that direction regardless she's already heading that way so what is driving that well the main driver for that is what's going on in italian and european art generally in other words the art informel movement that we met, learnt, uh, uh, met earlier. Um, so if we look at probably the most famous of the art informel uh, artists uh, of this period, Alberto Buri, uh, another Italian artist, uh, here in his composition of 1953, you'll see a number of things that are, are really quite similar to the Lazzari. Uh, you can see he uses a lot of Hessian, but it's very rough Hessian. It's almost like it must be coffee bags or something, as, as I imagine the Italian have uh, lots of access to coffee bags. Um, but uh, splashes of paint and other materials. This is using uh, uh, found objects uh, in an improvis in imp improvisatory way. So it's, it's improvising uh, based on what you find and the forms that you can make. Um, it's also, again, very organic. It doesn't have geometry about it. It doesn't have an obvious geometry about it. It's a kind of uh, uh, instinctive geometry, if it's there at all. It's instinctive, organic form. And then, again, you can see those red blotches on the uh, bury. So you get a little highlight just to lift the interest, because if you're looking at a brown object, it can be, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the most uh, interesting thing to look at. So he gives a little bit of highlight. We've got a bit of yellow paint in the top right hand corner and a little bit of red uh, sort of poking through from under the Hessian. Perhaps we can also go to Spain and make links with another one of the Art Informel uh, artists. As I said, Art Informel was not a single movement. So sometimes this art involving Buri and Tapias uh, is referred to as Art Bru, uh, has various different names. Uh, so here's Grey Ochre from 1958. Uh, very similar, I, I don't need to go through it really, but uh, you can see very similar both to Lazzari and to some extent to uh, Buri. So, we see her doing these uh, type of things, these kind of art informel uh, types of works in the mid to late uh, 1950s and coming more or less to an end, I suppose, round about 1963, 1964. So here is one from the early 60s um, and uh, you can see it's called Grey and Grey uh, or Grigio and Grigio uh, and uh, dating from 1962. So you've got a little bit, almost, almost looks like a little animal with eyes, um, but you've got this uh, a little bit of painting work, but really much of it is scratched into the ground, into the, uh, the surface layer of paint. Now, when we get to 1963 and we see this painting by Erzali, uh, it might look quite similar. It's monochrome again, so it's not, not necessarily the, the most exciting thing to look at into, if you're into colour, um, but um, it's also uh, uh, you know, got uh, that kind of impasto surface in places. You're seeing drips, you're seeing uh, the paint itself uh, is, uh, is, is not too hard edged, I suppose. But what I would also ask you to notice is that there is a kind of difference with this. We're starting to get the paint being organized into these regular blocks. So if you start looking at them, you see how regular they are. You can, you can look at this block here as a kind of unit and it gets doubled up here. And then it seems to perhaps that almost looks like it might be four of those units. There is a kind of regularity. Once you start looking at it, uh, you've got, you start with a single unit and you double it up a bit off perhaps and there we go we'll go for that one and then you four, you make it four times now it's a bit speculative that except um this is the moment when we start to find Lazzari a change in her direction a, a more conceptual language i'm going to describe it as starts to enter into the way she talks about her work at this point she starts to refer to her images as being constructed of signs now 
when we talk about signs in art history today, we don't quite mean this, um, what she meant by it. Today, a sign is something that, that, that indicates meaning, that symbolizes meaning, if you like. So uh, in critical theory in art history, um, the, the, the cross, for example, the crucifix signifies, is a sign for Christianity, for example, or Christian belief. Um, so it's a kind of symbolism in that way, a complex form of symbolism, but nonetheless a kind of symbolism. Um, Lazzari doesn't quite mean that, and I think in, in some ways um, it's better to think about the, the unit, uh, but she calls it signs. Um, uh, so each of this block, if I take that one as my, my starting point, each one of those blocks, that shape and that size becomes a sign or a unit, and that unit or sign can be replicated, it's doubled up, it's multiplied by four, it can become by six, and so on. Now, if we go to that rather unhelpful uh, statement by Vittorio Fagoni, um, I think this is what he's trying to get at here. Um, the a declared verticality that underlies the expansion of a chromatic continuum of abstraction towards the sort of leavening, uh, she says, uh, he says, and a constant interaction of the sign as varied repetition. That, that's the bit that's important, the interaction of the sign as varied repetition. I hope at last that's now making sense. Here we've got the sign and the way it interacts with other bits in the painting, it's repeated. So the sign the square here is repeated here twice, therefore it's uh, interacting, it's, it's, it's repeated twice, uh, here it's repeated four times. Well, this idea of the rep repetition of the sign is very much in the air in the early 1960s, throughout the 1960s into the 1970s, in fact. So that if we went to America, we'd find American artists such as Donald Judd, talking really about very similar things. So here, the unit, in other words, these rectangular or square blocks on the wall, in fact, they are square, uh, these square blocks stuck on the wall, uh, the unit gets repeated again and again and again. And in the case of Donald Judd, uh, we would think of this as a kind of minimalism. Um, the object becomes a kind, of, a kind of form, a form, a shape, a shape of particular dimensions to particular uh, qualities, particular colors that gets repeated. And you could repeat it again and again endlessly. If we were in England at this time, we might think of Kenneth Martin. Of what Kenneth, Kenneth Martin says, the elementary methods of constructions are related to the elements of life, the forces of life. Life is variable and inevitable, recurrent and de developable. It's that phrase there, recurrent. So you start off with a square again, in this case, and you can multiply it. So we end up with these sort of squares moving out. Um, you could end up with, I don't know what you call this, a kind of chevron, I suppose. Uh, you could end up with there and you keep multiplying it out. Here's a triangle, you multiply it out. So the same basic unit or sign gets repeated again and again. And as you repeat it, you multiply it, that builds up the surface of the picture, builds up the image. Uh, Kenneth Martin's partner, uh, Mary Martin, does exactly the same thing. Look at what she says. One commences with a single cell, she calls it. So the sign is now called a cell, almost like uh, a living organism. But she also says a unit, a cell or unit. And a logical process of growth is applied to the whole or the effect and is unforeseen. Um, sorry, the effect is unforeseen until the work is complete. Here, the unit is a flat piece of shiny metal, but is placed on an angle at each interface or each uh, section of this picture or this image, which you may be familiar with, it's in Tate Britain, it's a very large piece. So each one of these uh, uh, flat pieces of metal is, is, is angled at a different angle. So you've got the basic unit is the same for all of them. It's the same shape, but it put at a different angle and being put at a different angle, uh, it, um, it, um, uh, it, it sort of it becomes a, a slightly different thing or it takes on a slightly different form uh, here's uh, a much simpler version by um, Mary Martin so permutation of five uh, here you've got a series of prisms so these are, are little triangular blocks it's easier to see on the slight angle there you can see the little triangular blocks uh, each of them is put onto this surface at a different angle uh, and being put at a different angle uh, creates a different dynamic with the space. In other words, a different relationship with the space. Here it is from the other side. 
Well, all of that is far more hard edged, of course, than anything we're seeing in Lazari. So maybe we are making too much of this, except what starts to happen with Lazari uh, in the 1960s is that her art too becomes much more hard edge. So here, I don't know if you can see, um, we've got again, the unit or the sign is, um, well, it depends how you take it. it. It's actually a little rectangle. If you go down here, you can see it's almost like graph paper. It's lots of little rectangles uh, and they start off quite uniform in the corners, but they start to morph just like Mary Martin's prisms start to morph. Uh, so they go out of sequence perhaps, or maybe they're halved or maybe they're doubled, creating this curious appearance of almost like a curve. It's almost like a piece of op art, think of Bridget Riley in, in the, uh, in the uh, canvas here. And then to define the space, she creates this arc of line. The best text, I think, on her comes from the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice. Um, so here you can see the Guggenheim text on her. Uh, so this is on the catalogue entry for her. Uh, and this piece um, is from the uh, Guggenheim. Seeking to free herself from recollections, history, physicality and matter. So in other words, all the things you think about usually with art, you know, emotions, recollections, uh, psychology, things like that, history, physicality, the world around us. She shifted to basic rectiling rectilinear signs and their relationship to and within space. So the sign or the unit is a basic rectangle uh, and its relationship to space is defined through how it modifies across the canvas. Here's an example from 1974, writing number two. Again, we have that red line. And here we have what uh, almost look like accents on it, repeated marks. Uh, so the line itself is a, is a repeated mark, uh, changes color, changes size, uh, to some extent shape. We also have these, these vertical accents or diacritic marks almost uh, above it. And again, uh, we can perhaps think about uh, what uh, Lazzari herself has to say about these pieces. A sign, remember I'm using, she's using sign, but I'm using the word unit. A sign in the space may recall another sign and yet another one. They intersect each other to form spaces, which can be read. And that discourse of reading, that narrative of reading may reveal additional or hidden visual proper possibilities. So I'm trying to sort of paraphrase it there to make it a little bit more clear, you know, straight, straightforward. So the sign, that rectangle can be repeated again and again. And as it's repeated, it intersects, it modifies, but it also gives you a sense of what the space of the canvas is doing. And through that sense of what the canvas is doing, that sense of space, we get an idea that um, we are things are being revealed to us almost like it's a kind of metaphysical or transcendent state. Um, if you think of, uh, you know, of, 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 you know, I don't know, shamanistic ideas, you think of, you know, how do you, how do you, when we went to the Peru exhibition, we saw the Peru exhibition uh, on, on, the, on the, the talks, you know, how does a shaman get into true, a kind of trance-like state? Well, they may take some substances, drugs, but there's also other elements like repeated rhythms of a drum, which create a kind of hypnotic state. And this repeated rhythm of the shape, the same shape being repeated again and again within minimalism, within Lazari, I think as well, is a kind of a kind of route to a revelation, a kind of revelation of a new type of space. And I think if we were talking about Mary Martin or we're talking about Kenneth Martin, they would certainly understand that idea of uh, of of minimalist art being a kind of a kind of transcendent not necessarily a spirit as transcendence not necessarily a spiritual transcendence but kind of an altered state of mind through the repetitious a uh, repetition of the process here's another one from that uh, late uh, 60s period so again you can see the repetition this time it's really of the line it's the horizontal line uh, which creates uh, sorry, the vertical line, which creates uh, in the end these uh, these sort of uh, semicircular points uh, um, um, uh, forms, uh, and then she she creates these these sort of lines across them again, as we saw with the arc in the previous piece. So we're talking about units, structural units, structural units when that when you put them together, 
and allow them to be modified through a kind of rational process, uh, build up a sense of the space of the canvas. We start to think of the canvas as a space in the way that a formalist would think about the canvas as a space. So you have to do something to make that space work or make it interesting or make it function as they would see it. And one of the ways that Lazzari and other minimalists and other process-based artists, as they're also known, do that is through a simple shape, a simple form, which they repeat and modify in, multiple, in, in, in regular ways. Well, that brings me really to the end of the, the presentation on Lazzari. She died in 1981. She was living in Rome still. Uh, she was aged 80 at the time. Um, as we've heard, um, she was somebody who uh, wasn't particularly well known, at least not outside of Italy. And I think even within Italy, um, uh, for most of her life, um, she's described as being very shy, uh, particularly uh, in her youth, but uh, uh, she's not somebody who seems to go out and, and seek the limelight. Um, that uh, said, um, there is a kind of concerted effort at the moment to try and raise her profile. And I think in some ways it's, it's perfectly legitimate. I, I think in terms of what she is doing, she should be recognised alongside the likes of Kenneth Martin, Mary Martin, Donald Judd, uh, and so on. Um, that's not to say that she's particularly influential, because if you are not very well known, you're not going to be influential. So in some respects, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting example of a kind of parallel development from similar sources, uh, rather than uh, an artist who necessarily uh, is influenced by external sources or is feeding into them. Although, uh, as I said in the presentation, there is an element of that that does take place as well. <laughs>